Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Bryan. I'm a volunteer with the Southern Arizona VA. Uh, we're in Tucson, Arizona today at the home of uh, Air Force Officer Bob Bro. And uh, Bob was uh, in the military, served in Vietnam. Uh, we've already talked about some of the stories and it's just fascinating. We're in for a real treat today. So, Bob, why don't you give me your uh, full name and your uh, birth date? Robert? Paul Bro, the hard way, B R E A U L T, March 2nd, 1941. Well, today's date is uh, Sunday, March the 5th, 2017. So why don't we just get, we'll, we'll jump right in. I was, I've been reading some of your writings, and uh, it sounded like you were, even as a young person, you, you had your plan all laid out. I, you know, I had a plan, I knew what it was at, at a very young age. In uh, 1952, 58 era, that they didn't have these these rocket kits, and so I got into uh, rocketry and making my own rockets and my own fuel and my own engines, and yes, testing them, and they would blow up and go over two-story barns and parking lots and two-story house, and then end up on the second floor of my neighbor's house. And then I would launch, launch these things in downtown residential Naugata, Connecticut, and they'd go over church or row houses, streets, and another church. And I'd go in the neighborhood and start hunting it down, and sure enough, there it is in a bank or behind the church. And they'd be asking people, hey, you know, anybody here any, you know, metal and glass or something like that? So I was fessing up. But uh, and then I also got interested as a uh, seventh, eighth grader in uh, crystalline structures. We were poor. Uh, my dad didn't graduate from sixth grade. My mother didn't get her graduate equivalency until she was 53, and so she could go to college. So we come from uh, a, uh, you know, not a silver spoon or, you know, part of town. We lived next to a railroad station, and uh, the uh, U.S. Rubber Company was to the south, and Lewis Engineering, and so a little group of five homes, and so it wasn't a high rent district. But uh, I got, for some reason, interested in, I would go in the backwoods of Connecticut and find crystalline structures, and I would study, and I would buy my own uh, graduate or uh, college-level uh, books to understand why a certain material would have two crystalline structures. So I was able to touch these things, my rockets and my rocks, and uh, enough, enough of rocks that probably 30 feet, uh, six inches apart, three it says, um, my father's wall is still exists today. So I have a big collection and what, hundreds of hours in mines and uh, country there. But then in 1954, I read a book by Fred Hoyle, Frontiers of Astronomy. And what I read was what they could do, I still have the book, uh, with light, you could, you know, the, the distance, the size, the age, the composition of it. I went hook, line, and sinker. You know, that I was going to do space-based research. This is 54 now. On a Saturday morning, about 10 o'clock, I can remember sitting down and say, what am I going to do in my life? And I had been an altar boy in 7th, uh, 8th grade, and the one with the pastor every day. So I knew the, the entire Latin Mass, and I'm in Pachas, Peter Sanctum, Tripitari Deity. So, uh, but that uh, fateful uh, Saturday morning, uh, okay, you know, do I go to seminary school, or uh, this is three years before Sputnik, or, you know, you go in science and do space based research? You know, we hadn't done that yet. So on that Saturday morning, I chose also my Air Force career. I chose that, okay, I'm going to go do space-based research. It's 54 now, and I'm going to go and get a degree in mathematics, and I'm not going to be a mathematician. I'm going to use the math to do my physics and my science to do space-based research. But after graduating from undergraduate, I was going to you know, go in the Air Force, and I was going to go to Luke Nellison Edwards. And I did do Luke, and I did do Nellis. I didn't get to Edwards. And then after that, you know, I'll go fly for a period of time, and then I would uh, go to the University of Arizona. I'm a poor kid. I haven't been, but Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. I was going to go to Tucson, Arizona, and uh, uh, get my Ph.D. at age 36. Nobody in my family at that time had gone to one hour of college any place in the world. 
And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm not going to go to just college, I'm going to get a PhD and I'm going to do space-based research. I'm going to either be a pilot astronaut or a scientist astronaut. And Mike, at that time, I doubt there were 50 people in the world who ever contemplated that, you know, even for a microsecond. So I had a vision, I set it down, and uh, then for the record, I have failed more times than anybody you'll ever interview. But I picked myself up and uh, we, uh, you know, so that, you know, did the career and, you know, all sorts of stories which probably come out later in this video of, uh, you know, my trials and tribulations and how I overcame them. But that's for the video. Good deal. Well, when you were, uh, when you were young and, and before you started into college and whatever, uh, just paying for college was a big deal at the time. And it, I was reading somewhere where uh, your home had been flooded and... Yeah, and so in, this was 54, eighth grader, where I made the decision. And then uh, in August 19th of uh, 1955, uh, the uh, police and firemen came at six o'clock in the morning and said, you have to evacuate, you know, the uh, water has gone up 52 feet in the Nogatuck River from Hurricane Diane and that, uh, you know, so we got in a car and I had tennis, dungarees, uh, windbreaker, you know, shirt, you know, like much like this one. And uh, so we drove away and 40 minutes later the water was coming in the kitchen window and it went to four inches from the ceiling and we're underwater for three days. And uh, so you're know, talking about losing everything. Yes, I lost everything. Had to go to Red Cross and get underwear and clothes and, you know, stuff like that and yes we had to go to a friend's house and live there for a couple of months and uh, so it was a uh, very traumatic experience and especially for my older sister because she was getting married uh, October uh, 15th two months later or so and uh, her hope just had gotten flooded out I remember when we were evacuating you know I was you know Move, we're going to move, I moved a little bit of stuff. My railroad train set that I had, uh, American Flyers, up on the second floor. One hook of clothes to the second floor. My dad said, hey, we've been here 30 years, nothing's going to happen. But as we drove away, I could see the water coming up the backyard and it was just about to speed. So I knew, you know, hmm. I didn't know how much damage it was going to be. Never anticipated, uh, you know, 10 feet of water. Because yeah, the house was up off the uh, on a cement or a wall, you know, bricks for the cellar. So, uh, but then uh, October we moved back in, and unlike Katrina, my dad rehabbed the house, and uh, we were back in uh, early October. And then uh, my daughter, my daughter, my uh, sister got married October fifteenth, and it rained and it rained. And they went off at, you know, on a honeymoon, but at 11 o'clock at night, the doorbell rings again. And the firemen and policemen are there. And uh, beyond guard, you know, they flood uh, waters high again. And a second hundred year flood hit that night. Well, you're, the, the plans for college, uh, I mean, you're, you're losing everything in quick succession. Uh, it, your dad said something about not having enough money to send all the kids. Well, no, what, what happened is that this uh, eldest uh, sister, she had gone to Yukon Community College on a branch in Waterbury, but she would commute. But my dad hadn't gone to or even grammar school, or he got on her case almost weekly, and she would cry and say, so I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to test them all. Test them all, you know, high school, college, don't make any difference, you got to do this do that, put that away, and stuff like that, so she quit. And then after this flood, uh, the things were leveled, the garage was gone, we're in the backyard. And my dad and I were known to have literally fisticuffs on roofs. And so all of a sudden, uh, I'm pushing to get my sister who's 18 months old and me to go to college. And my dad uh, said that uh, they didn't have enough money. We'd just been in a flood and that, uh, you know, they only had $300, and if uh, he gives it to her, then I'm SOL, and he used all those words. And uh, so uh, if she goes, you're on your own. It cost me $300 to you know, feed you for nine months, so that's what you'll get. And I said, do it. And, then he, and I call it the famous spittle contest, because we were yelling, and all the neighbors were in the windows now, all around us watching, uh, okay, here they go again. They're going to you know, slug it out. And uh, so... Uh, 
I, I said, you know, well, do it. And he said, well, we're going to have to sell the second cars, Mercury. And essentially, I was the only driver, so it was mine. I said, do it. And he did. And so uh, then oh, I was a decent football player, so I got a, a scholarship to Rutgers. And so, okay, you know, that covers my expenses and uh, playing football, I like that. But then in March of my senior year, 1958, uh, that and by March, all the schools have you know, accepted all the people and maybe some people are waiting list. So I'm in a classroom and the principal of Nautic High School comes in the classroom and asks the teacher, I'd like to see Bobby Bro in the hallway for a minute. <laughs> all my peers are what happened. <laughs> you know, I got worried about something serious that happened to my parents because I had never had any interaction like this before. And so it really scared me, and we go out in the hallway, and he stands so towers over me, and he says, Son, I have a question for you. How would you like to go to Yale? <laughs> Sign me up. Uh, no, it wasn't that. It was, oh. I mean, it was, you know, how, how, would, you, how would you like to go to uh, Pluto? You know, we, <laughs> we forget about Mars, we're going to go to Pluto. You know, the same thing, it's so far-fetched uh, reality that, you know, and I said, Sir, you, you know, I'm, I'm poor in our family, we don't have anything. We, we couldn't even make a token contribution to Yale. Son, that's not the question I asked you. I'll ask you again, how would you like to go to Yale? And I can remember my words precisely, sir, I'm smart enough to know that, sure, you know, I would love to go to Yale, but, you know, where's this going? You know, what, why? You know, I don't understand. So what, I just got a phone call from admissions at Yale, and they wanted to know if I had somebody who was academically strong, a potential future leader in the world and somebody who didn't have the wherewithal to consider applying to Yale. And this is after they accepted you know, just about all their class. And the principal says, and you answered, you know, the last question and out of the answer to the first two, can you get your family car, drive down there? I lived about 30 minutes north of New Haven. And, well, if you help me, call my mother. And uh, so it took him about a half an hour to get to the 9,000 people at the U.S. Rubber Company, get to the boss, and get to my mother, and, and she said, yeah, okay, well, what's going on? I don't know. So here I get suited up, go home and get suited up and drive down, and I'm doing the interview, and that was a traumatic experience, too. Courageous I am. And uh, so I'm one-on-one -on -one with this vice president of Yale in charge of admissions, and he asked me, you know, what I wanted to do, and you know, I wanted to do and get a degree in mathematics. I wanted to do space-based research and why, and all this kind of stuff, much like what's going on in the interview here. And uh, so, uh, then, how much uh, can your parents afford? Because we expect, uh, and right now, it's like sixty thousand plus to go to Yale, and we expect, uh, you know, the parents come up with one third, and a student to earn, you know, two jobs, one third, and Yale, we. Uh, except blind, and, uh, and I, I'm scared. And he then asked me, "How much do you think you, know, you and your parents can contribute?" And it really terrified me. And uh, I'm, I'm not smiling. You know, at the time, I think, "Oh Jesus!" And, and, okay, three hundred dollars. And I thought he said, "God dang, we've been talking for an hour and a half. Get out of here! You know, I'm wasting my time." <laughs> And uh, so he grabs a little notepad, a three by five notepad you can buy in any office depot store, and he writes down and uh, he hands it to me. I still have it in my memoirs. And half scholarship, quarter loan, quarter work. So essentially, you know, that was my entry. And, uh, and, and part of that entry asked what I was going to do. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to uh, do mathematics, and since Rutgers and Dartmouth and Brown and Harvard have been recruiting me for football, and you know, I think okay, everybody wants me, you know, my bod, and so well, and you know, do the math and science and physics, and uh, but I uh, play foot freshman football. Talking about it, and he said, well, it's Bob. He said, you know, all your, you know. Thoughts, you know, seem real good in line with Yale, but I don't think you're coming from a public school and you're going to be, uh, you know, competing against well-prepared prep students. And with all due respect, you're not as prepared as they are. So don't, you know, go off of football your freshman year. It doesn't make any difference with the varsity. But if you do, you know, cut the mustard well in academics, then go out in your so sophomore year and play football. And I stopped and thought, I said, 
this is the only person I interviewed who was after my brain and not my body. I'm coming. And so uh, I come home, you can imagine, here you are. Oh, I was a year younger because uh, I was a mischievous little four-year-old. Uh, you know, I, I went to grammar school uh, you know, younger, a year younger than they normally allow. So I was by far younger, or oh, let's see, it must have been uh, 16 years old. And uh, the, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, pretty uh, traumatic to come home as a 16 year old and say, hey, mom and dad, I just got a, uh, accepted at Yale on a full boat scholarship. You can imagine mom and dad, you know, where's this coming from? So they were very proud of me. And, you know, well, to kind of fill in the blanks, we're from that point to going into the military, because that was kind of on your plan too, is to uh, talk a little bit about that transition and how you ended up in the military from that point that you're at now. Okay, well you may want to cut this portion out, but at Yale they had a ROTC program and I chose not to do ROTC. I took enough of uh, math course, I got my degree in four years, but I took enough of physics that if I took one more course I would add a dual degree in physics, and I took enough electrical engineering, so if I took two more I would add a triple degree. And remember, I was working quarter time. So uh, it, it was nip and tuck uh, that I was uh, going to graduate. Somebody should have grabbed me by the collar and said, son, you're here for one degree, pick it, what it was. But it wasn't going to be ROTC. So at uh, graduation, they had officer training school. And so well, and I was at the end of getting my degree, I found out about officer training school in Medina in San Antonio. And so, okay, that was, I wasn't going to take the summer off. And so in August of 62, or uh, I uh, went and signed up, swore myself in, and uh, the, uh, uh, and you know, they reported a story, if you, if you notice, that I have glasses. And I had glasses in college, too. And at the time, you're supposed to be 2020. And for the record, you know, to get in the Air Force, it, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, in 1962, the I chart read T E C F O X I D P N H, <laughs> as the Space Cowboys you know, video goes. So, uh, you know, I didn't have 2020 vision, but I had 2020 recall. <laughs> and so, uh, sure enough, I go to officer training school, and again, I'm a football player. And so, the fourth day there, uh, Buchanan was my uh, roommate. Uh, the officers come in. Hey, we need you know, players for the officers' flag football team. You guys, you know. Well, you know, we got drills. Listen, we're in charge of this. Answer the question. You want to be on your officer flag football team or not? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, and then they go to, we come back and I say, okay, shower up and go. We're going to take the officer club. Uh, uh, sir, we're pleased. We're not allowed in the officer. Oh, God, shape up, will you? <laughs> we're the officers. You're our guests. You're going to come to the officer's club for supper tonight or not? Yes, sir. And so I, I've only had. Uh, like four days of military, you know, the other guys cleaning the urinals with toothbrushes and all that kind of stuff, and we would be going to practice, come back, be, you know, pounding the, out in the hot sun, you know, me, I'm in a football uniform playing football, and so, yeah, I had a charmed life, and then graduated at the top of the class, so this is important for later, I became a regular commissioned officer, and then my assignment was uh, to Vance Air Force Base in uh, Enid, Oklahoma, and talk about being in the middle of nowhere. You know, I've gone back to reunions here, and it's amazing how much in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, Vance was. And so uh, we entered, we were the second last class to uh, train uh, in the T-33. The T-28 came the two classes later. But uh, all of that is uh, many books of memoirs of, uh, you know, how, how much fun it was. So then, after the, uh, the 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 transition then to uh, regular duty, that were you committed to going into the military after your graduation, uh, or or did you have a, cho a choice of whether to go in or not? Oh, I had a choice. I because I, I didn't take ROTC, I had no obligation. You know, Yale was Yale, and there was no implied. You know, I could take and I go to okay. graduate school. So. I chose, as, but again, as a 14-year-old, I wanted to be the pilot astronaut or the scientist astronaut. So, you know, I, I needed that experience, and, and the time to get it then was uh, 
right after undergraduate you know, or college and you get you know the experience and get seasoned. I was younger than anybody, so uh, it was an important uh, transition period for me. So I was on a path. Mm -hmm. I, laid, I laid it out, you know, as a what thirteen year old in eighth grade on a Saturday morning, as I said, and then you know. Just you know, kept, kept on trudging. So you're on track. On track to this day. Okay. So what happens <laughs> to this day? Yeah. Okay. But you know what, what happens after you know? So I go to Vance, and as I said, I, I fail more times than anybody else. And my first eight flights, I get sick, and so like you know, ten other students, they're going to wash me out. But uh, we had we're the first. A class of where uh, we weren't plebes, unenlisted. We were, you know, we were officers already going in, and so we had Captain Hanna, who was from uh, the uh, Weather uh, Service, and then uh, Captain uh, uh, Heiser, who was a navigator who gone through the pilot program to become pilots. And so when I got washed out, uh, we were buddies and. I, I could go up and do barrel rolls and uh, fly formation very, very well, at, you know, as good as anybody. But uh, when they would say they type the land, they actually bark back and come out every time. And uh, so they're going to uh, essentially ground me. I was grounded and uh, to wash me out. But Captain Heiser and Captain Hanna uh, said uh, to instruct the pilots to test them. He's good, but you know. We don't know what it is. So we did the ice water wheel bearing test and you know, found out that he didn't have spatial disorientation. And so really what it was was an anxiety. And so they set me up with a new instructor pilot, Tom Wiley, a southern gentleman that in the wind, if he was walking, he would be going backwards. And so my first flight with him, I almost oh, made it, but somebody was on the runway and there's a canopy down, locked light out. And the mobile control asked this single, you know, student in the cockpit of the T-37, "Well, how's the wind out there?" I said, "Oh, about five knots. Uh, yeah, can it be going down? Yeah, and take a pink slip for this one." So I had to go around, and I got sick. And uh, the next flight, uh, it was a rainy day, and we uh, only uh, flew patterns. And so I got up with Tom Wiley, and uh, you know, flew and. Uh, uh, Colonel Spade, not Colonel Major, Major Spade, the uh, squad commander for the flying flight train. Apparently, he's talking, and I come in the world and uh, in a room, and uh, the uh, Captain Hannah looks over at me as I sign him back in, and he goes, and I turn around to the class, and a whole class erupted like a Chinese fire drill, and Major Spade is looking around. He has no idea what's going on. And they're clapping and cheering. They all come over. It's forget the class. They all come over and congratulate me. And I never got sick again. And so it was when when I you know, story later around when I was in graduate school that uh, I uh, was the first one to uh, fail the uh, PhD, get kicked out of the PhD program. And uh, I, I took the qualifying exam and I failed and took a second one. And so they washed me out into the master's program. Then my uh, GPA was so high that at the end of the master's program, I said, hey, we changed our mind, go get your PhD. And when I got my PhD, my PhD won the, uh, one of the Hoopy won the uh, award for the best applied dissertation of the year. So I've been, you know, down in the pits uh, over and over and over again. But in advance, I graduated at the top, near the top of the class, and so I get my F-100 assignment. There were only two of them. And so then, uh, you know, my last assignment was as a Top Gun instructor at Nellis. So again, almost washed out. And then, okay, top of the pilot training class, top of you know fighter pilots, you know. And so uh, Top Gun pilot. Yeah, and uh, then uh, same thing, you know, in the dissertation. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it hasn't been, uh, you know, quote unquote, an easy walk, but. When you have the moral compass that you know, when I failed, spun around you know, literally, and okay, north is that way, and you get back on that trail. And by the way, I'll get it in now that uh, when I graduated uh, with my PhD in uh, 1979, 
that I formed my own company, a research organization, to do space-based research. I have worked on the Hubble and IRAS, but you know, I, over my life, 286 different systems, Hubble, Galileo, Cassini, Derby, Kobe, Spitzer, LIGO, all that kind of stuff. And I started my company, and two weeks later, unsolicited, I still don't know to this day where it came from, is a uh, application uh, by NASA to the astronaut program. Wow. Oh, jeez. They don't you know, just hand those things out. Yeah, in 1979, you know, I could be, you know, what my dream is, you know, be an astronaut. Or, you know, I got my company and I've got contracts and I'm working on all these space based uh, systems and I'm working with Nobel laureates one on one alone, even as a student. And this is pretty fantastic this way. And, oh my God, this is real fantastic. But I thought about it and uh, at the time in 1979, they stopped. Oh, not all the astronauts were getting space-based missions, but I knew Gus Grissom, he called me when I was at Yale, and uh, then in the Friday pilots, uh, the, uh, we have the Apollo 9 commander. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, I, I knew these people, and it was, oh, it's, it's real, you know, hard. but I don't regret, you know, taking, like, the decision that I did, you know, for it. Mm -hmm. You know, the things that I've worked on is fascinating science and my company and my people that work on, we became pioneers in the field of optics. Well, if you had gone into the astronaut school or that, that line of training, then is there a chance that you would have been able to exercise some of your education in the way that you wanted? Yeah, Mike, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I would have been there and I would have been, you know, hunting for, you know, one of these space-based missions. I should, surely an orbital mission and then uh, doing observations and pioneering, you know, so it's just, oh yeah, I can imagine, oh, uh, you know, I got a grin on my face. You know, that would have been a good, uh, and I would talk about it and brag about it as much as I talk about for research. But, uh, now, you know, I, you know, I was given opportunities. I had failed so many times, but, you know, given, uh, you know, and, and the discipline, quite honestly, of being in the Air Force, the military training uh, of camaraderie, of uh, sharing, and, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, but I'm the best. Uh, and in optics, it's pretty much the same. That, yeah, I'm a leader in, you know, optics and well renowned in the world, but my employees, you know, they'll tell you they're better than I am. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a healthy sense of, uh, I'm good, you're okay, you can be my wingman. No, no, no. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to be you be my wingman. <laughs> well, talk a little bit about then your deployment. Uh, so you got your wings, or uh, when you my, get out, you, you get your wings. My good question. Yeah. And so my uh, first assignment uh, after Vance was to England Air Force Base, uh, Louisiana, and this is now uh, like sixty, early sixty four. And at the time, they were losing F-100 pilots out in item because of uh, not my beloved McNamara. And, uh, and so uh, from that end of it, we had, he, he had said that he had increased the Air Force by uh, 30%. When I got to England Air Force Base, there were uh, four squadrons, and one was uh, deployed to Misawa in Gunsan, Korea. The one was on uh, immediate alert. You could be outside of 30 minute phone contact. We didn't have cell phones at the time, so you couldn't go down from uh, England Air Force Base to New Orleans because that was more than 30 minutes. And uh, then the other one had you know five people in a squadron commander, and the fourth one had squadron commander. It was vacant. So there was no increase, you know, it was just in a fictitious number. And so we were pretty, uh, you know, ticked. I even told my uh, squadron commander, Colonel Blakeney, that. Sir, you know, I'm going to uh, New Orleans, and you know, if the war starts, start it without me because you know I'll, I'll get back when I can. And so you know, we are. But because everybody had been deployed, I was sing single. The uh, assignment said, "Hey, Bob, that you know, you you're barely qualified to do this, but we're tired, you know, and we're losing pilots, and so." We got an assignment to fill at uh, Polar Strike uh, in Ileson, Fairbanks area of Alaska for five weeks. And uh, you're gonna freeze your butt off, but uh, the, uh, you know, would you take it? Yes, sir. No, I'm Air Force, true and blue. 
So we go up there and it was to go to Arctic Survival School and uh, the, uh, I'd gone to Stead and I'd gone to Langley and uh, so now, you know, another one and, you know, it was uh, hokey pokey stuff, you know, and being the, the fighter pilot, you don't play by the rules and uh, you know them and you, know, you have to go out for five days uh, and you build uh, with your saw and, and your seat pack and all this kind of, you know, some kind of a shelter, but you had to be 100 yards away from anybody else. And so uh, I fell a tree and up there the trees are short and so I felt, still to this day, feel bad that environmental impact. And cut the branches and put the parachute on, put the snow on. But inside I smuggled in two sterno cans, lipped noodle soup, or Hershey's hot chocolate and cocoa. And uh, so I'm in the, you know, my, you know, thing nobody else around. I'm have, I had a great, you know, you know, stuffed myself with good, you know, nutritious, you know, funny stuff. And one of the things they have up there are wolverines, and so uh, it was a very vicious, you know, you know, animal. So I snuggle into my little camp and I have my duffel bag and you know, block the door. And all of a sudden I hear crunch, 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 crunch. It circled me three times. And all of a sudden I'm just panicking and it's all of a sudden I get dump, 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 dump. And I got my knife out and I'm ready to go. And all of a sudden I realized that dump, dump, dump my, is my pulse in my ear. <laughs> and, and the crunch, crunch, crunch in the snow was from the heat that I was doing two sterno cans and two candles. You know, you know I was first class in, in that tent, but it was melting. <laughs> and so that's the most panicked I've ever been. But and, you painted uh, a Wolverine face on, on all of that. Yeah, and then <clears throat> at that time at England Air Force Base, the 100 were known as a Widowmaker. Uh, uh, we, we lost 12 planes that year and six pilots. In Vietnam? No, this is peacetime, this is pre-Vietnam. Pre and you know, it, the, the, the 100 had adverse yaw and you know, you're flying you know, missions and my uh, first mission, uh, we asked, we got asked and you know, my uh, you know, Captain Seaman, uh, flight lead, you know, sort of my first mission to the range. They said, hey, you know, we need some sick time in a KC-97 for refueling, you know, so we go and try and find it, we can't. Now, I'd never done a KC-97, I'd done 135. And uh, so uh, when we get back to the airport, they said, we've got to change the runway. They're like, no, I landed with 300 pounds, which is basically empty in the F-100. The gauge is not that accurate. And so, you know, I landed with a 20-knot tailwind. So, you know, yeah, we have, we, we have lots and lots of uh, stories, uh, typical fighter pilot stories. So then you, that, that loss of aircraft, what was, what was that all about? Well, you're flying low missions, you're pulling off uh, targets, you're pressing minimums. Uh, when I would get, become the range officer at uh, England Air Force Base uh, and became renowned, I busted three bird colonels off the range for busting minimums. And it's enough so that I can remember one time grabbing the binoculars and a flare gun and I'm going by my squadron to get in the car to go down, you know, 20 miles to the range and, you know, hey, Lieutenant, you know, you range officer today? Yes, sir. New briefing, guys. This sucker, he bust burn curls. Don't press minimums today. And so uh, I was renowned for that. But then when we went to Vietnam, that uh, five of the people that I busted in the squadron off the range uh, hit sampans, trees, died in Vietnam combat. Because when you go in, you're in a range, in England Air Force Base, you fly a route, you fully fueled fly a route, and you get down there so you have enough time to do your drop and drop and shooting up. Uh, but you're low on fuel, you know, you're, 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 you're lighter. Well, in, in combat, you can take off and, you know, five miles away uh, is, you know, where, where you're attacking. So you're fully fueled, you have a couple hundred, uh, a 500 pound bomb, a couple of napalm cans. So if you do the same pressing the minimums and try to pull out, you, your weight ratio is different. So the pancake in. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Colonel Blakeney was uh, my squadron commander. He was the sixth one that had busted off the range. Nothing, you know crazy uh, you lieutenant I was and I take him to supper and, and I can remember scolding him called Blakeney 
you're the only one out of all these people that I busted off the range, and you know, several of them are dead. And you know, the only reason why you haven't, you know, had trouble is because you don't fly enough missions, you know, as a squadron commander. So, don't press. You know, unlike what you did, you know, when you're on the range in practice, it's a different world. And so he lived for, uh, I know, forever. Wow. That's a, so when you uh, get into Vietnam, then. You're based in Thailand. The first one, you know, I did two tours. Well, well I did, you know, two pieces of one tour. Mm -hmm. So I get my assignment and uh, three days off my honeymoon and uh, welcome. And uh, I had three people in the squadron ground blatantly trying to get me to flunk out of the training program at Eglin. But again, as I said, I, you know, I chose. You know, I thought about it. I said, no, I'm not going to do this because if I don't go somebody else in the squadron is going to get it and if they die uh, you know that's going to be a burden on me for the rest of my life you know I got the short straw I do it and uh, and it's true that when I went to uh, Karat that uh, my ops officer followed me Clyde Dawson and he died on his first mission so you can imagine if I had skipped out and he went you know, routinely I had no connection you know, to this day, I'd still be remorseful that, you know, he took my seat. And uh, so from that end, though, uh, we went uh, to Eglin, and where there were only uh, seven, uh, they ended up in the Wild Weasel program. They photographed the chart uh, as a contract, and then the company built uh, by Radio Shack parts and not stand no standard stuff. and. You know, got that stuff working because we were losing air superiority. The uh, North Vietnamese had run in the Russian SAMs, and uh, they were killing us, literally. Uh, the, F the strike pilots, 105s. So they come up with this uh, concept on a truck board, they photograph it, and that was a contract. And, uh, you, know, you know, in that time, I get the assignment even before they fly in missions. And I, I go to England Air Force Base and fly, you know, five or six missions of, so okay, this is what it's going to be like. And then they ship me over uh, to Karat, Thailand. And I'm, here I am, a first lieutenant, and I'm supposed to be flight lead qualified, and I was. And uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble right now uh, that uh, they didn't like me, you know, my, my unit. Uh, you know, uh, Major Willard, his unit commander, it was very, very nice. But Alan Lamb, like a typical fighter pilot, he was the first one to get a SAM. Uh, he and I had uh, uh, bad blood between us because here I am, a uh, first lieutenant, and I'm supposed to be, you know, you know he talks about in a video for us in Last Out that they invest the best of the Air Force, you know, uh, flight lead qualified pilots and stuff like that. So, you know, but this is. Uh, Early January, we had seven planes and 12 pilots. By the 15th of uh, February, we had no planes. All seven planes were destroyed. Five of the pilots were dead and one was captured. And so uh, when it got down to two planes, there was a call and Alan uh, was bitching that, uh, you know, I was there and I wasn't, you know, I didn't meet the specification. I was supposed to be flatly qualified and I wasn't that. And I said, I am. And he used the F word and, uh, and uh, you know, he's, he's a major and I'm a first lieutenant. And, uh, but being in, in all, you know, Major Willard, unit commanders, and all the other pilots and uh, EVOs are there. And uh, so we got into a yelling car and I grabbed him by the collar. I'm a lieutenant, he's a major come and I go storming into Major Willard's office and I open up the file cabinet drawer because I know where they were, my records. I open up and I said, you read that to everyone in this uh, you know, unit. And mm -hmm. I am flight equipped. <clears throat> in fact, you took 20 to, you know, 100 hours to become flight equipped and I did it in 400. You can't be. I said, it's there. <laughs> and so, uh, but they uh, sent me and Navy Brand uh, home because they didn't need us, and that was rightfully so. So then I came back to uh, England Air Force Base with the 614th, lucky devils, lucky I was, and uh, they deployed to Fan Rang. And so uh, that, that's an interesting uh, experience too. I had been, we missed it, I had gone to uh, Thong, uh, uh, 
refuel emissions uh, to uh, Masao, Japan, and then we did duty on Kunsan Korea nuclear alert. And it's very interesting to have 27 megaton four feet below you, and the only one in the plane. Now, that's a whole other experience of that time. But when we're going over, uh, my, you, know, uh, you get, uh, let's see, you know, from Louisiana to Hickam, and that's a long flight, and you got seven refuelings. And at the time, they would have planes out there, and that was your nav aid. And, but finding a, a radio station on the ADF, and so uh, we're maybe two, three hours out on a 10-hour mission, refueling mission, all that kind of stuff, and all of a sudden, it's click, click, you know, you know 10, 1040, and it's radio silence, you know, 1040, and that's all it is, 1040. I'm like, what the hell is that? You know, I recognize that voice, and then click, 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 click. So you have to bar it, right? You know, what's going on? Oh, well, Mike, you know, you found the ADF uh, signal uh, at 1040 on the dial, and so that was, and we were down there, we were going to buy him a drink, because he's the first one. Oh, that came, I didn't know that. And so uh, the, uh, the, when I deployed to uh, Fan Rang Air Force Base, then uh, the lieutenant would dial in and dial in and dial in, and dial in uh, 1040. And click, 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 click. And so it, it, there's a lot of camaraderie and, and friendship there. So yeah, it was good. The other one, you know, that is a you known piece of history is that when we went uh, to Misawa, it's a, or you go overseas and you didn't, we weren't allowed uh, beards, but you know, guys started growing mustaches. And I'm a mature, blitter guy, and so, uh, you know, drawing, uh, growing a mustache was it? I'm everybody, everybody yeah. Then it, once you're there for two months, everybody has a mustache, and you know it's not the time to you know, to grow one. You know, you know, you lost that opportunity. But when we went to Fan Rang, you know, I right off the bat I knew this game. I'm going to play it, so I grew a nice mustache. And uh, but there was this other guy who had a shadow uh, 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 at 11 o'clock, five o'clock shadow came at 11 on him. He was heavy bearded. But his lip was about half the size. It's it, it just no place for a mustache. And so again, being fighter pilots, me, leader of the troop, but everybody else is saying, "Hey, Pete, you know what's that? You got you know, the magic marker on your you know, lip or something there?" You know, and uh, he could not. And he there was no mercy. He finally you know shaved it off. He did not grow a mustache. You can't make those things grow. You can't make them grow if you don't have the area. <laughs> <laughs> and so that that's another fun experience where you know you're, you're the youngest one in the squadron and uh, just before I left Van Rang to go to my assignment to Nellis's Top Gun School, uh, they we got a, a the, another first lieutenant. I was now a captain, but he was the only lieutenant in the squadron, much like I was. And uh, uh, Lou Whistledick is, is his name. I can't remember how to pronounce it, but you know it was so close that. It was that, and he was every bit as good a replacement. I was very proud to have my seat as the lieutenant replaced by one who was just as good or better than I was. And so, uh, yeah, there's a certain amount of love involved. In so how many, how many missions did you fly? Oh, only nine in North Vietnam because we lost planes, but like 280 missions in South Vietnam. That, in one in one month, I flew something like 61 uh, missions, and I can remember the 61st uh, mission. It was over by uh, Saigon, north of Saigon. And I'm coming in on a target, and I'm talking to myself. You're getting too low, so I'm strafing. You're, too, you're getting too low. You better pull off. You're getting too low. I pull off, and the trees were above me, and the ground was probably four feet below me. And I'm pulling off, talking to myself. Hey, you know that was you, know, you almost creamed yourself. And I got up on down one. Whoa! I finally woke up. It's, it's, you have these thoughts and these feelings, and mm -hmm. but you don't internalize them. But when I can remember up on Downman, when I said, "That's stupid," you weren't even li listening to yourself. You know, target fixation, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was fatigued, battle fatigue. So flew back, normal, landed fine. But right after that mission, I go up to Colonel Blake and I said, "I want to be grounded." That, uh, I've got mission fatigue, and you know, and so here's what happened. And playing up, sure enough, I'm you know, self-grounded myself for three days, mm -hmm. and then I went back and 
to, you know, can I talk about one of my favorite missions? Absolutely. All right. And, uh, 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 yeah. The, uh, oh, come on. It'll come. Yeah. No. Uh, oh, come on. Misty too. Bill Douglas. He was one of my best friends. Rick Gio, or here in town, or was one of my mentors. Uh, and uh, Bill Douglas had been a uh, uh, forward track and got shot with a 50 caliber in the ankle and I said he would never uh, walk again. Well, he became an uh, F-100 pilot. But God dang it, uh, I was on alert with him on times and his first one to sign in, uh, check in, became flight lead. And here's this guy, Gimp, and I go running out to the airplane and I get there. I know I got him and so you, 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 uh, G-suit is on the uh, step ladder and you know, put that on and you climb up and you get the helmet on and buckle up and you call in and Bill Douglas is on the line. The damn guy is Gimp, you know, how does he do this? <laughs> so this goes on for a month, maybe longer. And I'm coming back from another mission time. I mean, he's on alert with somebody else. And so, you know, plane thing goes off, so I'm watching, make sure no planes are pulling out and, you know, Bill comes out and his, you know, other pilot is, you know, getting to the plane first and Bill is gimping and gimping and gimping along. But what he does, he takes his G-suit and puts it over his shoulder. He climbs up in the ladder. He stands on the seat. He plugs in his helmet and he checks in. Ah, tricky son of a gun. <laughs> and uh, so the ne next time I'm on alert with him, you know, the lieutenant does the same thing that, you know, I, I go and grab the chute, come up there and click in, I check in and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm putting on my G-suit standing on the seat in the F-100 and, uh, but I'm listening in and then, you know, Bill checks in and, you know, uh, you know, dum dum flight, you know, you know, one one checking in and Bill, I'm already on. Whoa! <laughs> and so the mission there was again, uh, north, northwest of Saigon, and it was an orbit mission, and we were the second flight on, and my load was uh, on CBUs, combat uh, bomb units, and what had happened was that uh, 12 Army uh, grunts had gone across the uh, open field into the encampment of what was later 800 Via Kong, and so uh, 800 to 12 were not good odds, and so uh, I can remember coming in with my CVU units, wondering, gauging a uh, win, and so drop them with a little bit of safety, but you know, they were right on top of them. And then looking back and say, oh, well, I can go about 50 feet to the right of that. And so we did that. All 12 uh, Army uh, people got out alive, or two of them were wounded, the other 10 alive. But there happens to be a general of some rank watching all these flights, and 26 flights, I was the second one in there. And so the general dictated that all uh, flight needs become get a silver star. So that's how I got my silver star. Awesome. And I got my DFC and all that kind of stuff. But uh, not not all of us got silver star. But I remember that mission uh, very well. I was very proud of that mission. And uh, but again, uh, you know, sometimes we had uh, a flight. I can remember. Uh, and I pull off my target, and you sometimes you got hit. I never personally got bodily hit, but my plane got bullet holes in it. And uh, the uh, I lost all my electricity, and so now I, I got three other planes, you know, in, in the formation. Okay, but I can't reach them, and then, you know, trying to find up to somebody who's doing a strike on the target, you know, that's not very smart. So uh, in, I'm in the south part of South Vietnam. And, it's twilight, and it's, it's not twilight, it's dark, but it's starlight, and fortunately you can see the starlight off the ocean, so I start heading back, and I'm told later that the guy said, hey, Dum Dum 2, you know, where are you? You know, acknowledged Dum Dum, and they're looking for, you know, a pile of smoke someplace, you know, did I ding in? And uh, they get hit and, you know, shot down, whatever, and then they get on radar, and uh, they say, yeah, we have a, a flight uh, about 20,000 feet heading towards uh, Van Rang, it's probably yours. And then again, you know, no electricity, no microphone, no uh, communications. And 
So you're, you're looking to make sure the pump is still pumping and the fuel is still going or else you're going to end up bailing out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so then I approach uh, Fan Ring and I can't tell anybody, you know, hey, I'm here, you know, and I'm going to land and I'm looking around in a pattern, but I can remember looking at the tower and I got a double green light. So they knew I was there and so I made a straight in landing, dropped the gear and, you know, landed and uh, so there, there was those you know moments of shock terror and you have to okay here's what you're trained to do do it so the the image of a fighter pilot being sort of uh, out on the edge of risk and the bravado that goes into all of that how, how accurate is portrait is that it, extremely i told you that when i was in well, England Air Force Base, we lost 12 planes. Bill Douglas at the same time was in Lake and Heath, and they lost 11 F-100s in that year. So uh, you, you start talking, you know, you got a couple hundred planes, but, you know, you lose a dozen you know, of them. Uh, that, you know, that plus, was pretty traumatic. Plus the people. You know, half the people, in my case, six people. Yeah. I mean, you flew with them, you ate with them, and uh, so, uh, yeah, it, and it... it uh, you, you knew uh, that, you know, e even if you look up on the you know, characteristics of the F-100 published and it says that, you know, the, you know they found out about adverse you know, bad handling conditions at low speed, high angle of attack in North America never chose to fix it. What they relied on was the courage uh, and the skill of the pilots. And so uh, it was uh, one of those things that, you know, you learned the hard way, some didn't. It's awesome to have that in your rearview mirror, I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you, know, you know, have I, uh, you know, done some uh, dumb things and seen, you know, yeah. That, uh, my last assignment when we were at Las Vegas, I'm just confessing, you know, time limitations are all up. That uh, when I got uh, ordered to the command post as penalty for resigning, maybe we'll cover that, but uh, four year because uh, I was a regular commissioned officer and they could do that. I had no squadron, so I would, you know, get a plane and, you know, they'd have it ready for me and I'd take off and head east and uh, uncontrolled airspace and, yeah, I'd fly 10 feet off the ground uh, over Lake Powell and, uh, you know, Grand Canyon. I flew to Grand Canyon at 100 yards above uh, the water from uh, Bright Angel Trail all the way to Lake Mead and you know zigging and zagging. It was it's an actually thrilling experience and you know or Havasu Falls and I got pictures of it like you know 100 yards above uh, that you know circling around. And I'm sure the Indians and everybody else was saying get that guy out of here. But uh, so uh, I never got uh, reported and uh, we did those kind of things. That even in Vietnam we were forbid forbidden to come back low level. But we always did it. That you know, we just briefed each other. Hey, if I get you know shot down, and that's what they were worried about. It's expensive. Uh, that you know, put me 50 miles to the east, hung bomb and blew up, and uh, you know, they won't find me here. Or they won't find me there. So uh, just you know, I'll buy your story. You buy my story. And uh, yeah, I can remember. Yeah. And oh, oh, I shouldn't say this. And, uh, when I die, there's going to be one Vietnamese. You know, man, I remember with, I won't name my flight lead, and we're flying down and below treetop level, and they're beautiful. Vietnam has beautiful waterfalls and beautiful forests and you know, villages and whatever, but we go into this wide open area on the top of a mountain, and I go down, and, uh, and flight lead is down, and he goes, but then all of a sudden, right at this edge line is this Vietnamese and white soup and walking right under my flight path. And I didn't pull up because I knew if I pulled up that all my jet wash would even hit him harder on this edge, you know. Oh. You know. When I finally got past, I pulled up and looked around and couldn't find him. So uh, I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> Just from your, from the... Jet wash, you're doing like jet wash, you know, you know. 350, 400 knots. I mean, and you're 10 feet above me, you know, yeah, I'm going to get blown. Oh boy, I took your breath away. So then, as you got toward, where, where are we in your path now to be doing what you're... Wanting? Okay, that's good. Excellent question. That One, when I, I got uh, to Nellis, uh, Major Willard, Colonel Willard, uh, 
you know, got me to be a uh, wild weasel instructor in the 100, but rightfully so, as I flew from Van Rang uh, to Nellis, they canceled the program. It, the mess match was in the F-100, it was getting old. And so uh, they went to uh, 105s and then F-4s and F-111s, and that was uh, logic, F-16s now. Uh, so uh, I arrived there and they don't know what to do with me. And uh, so uh, they don't, you know, assign me to a squadron because I'm supposed to, what are they going to do with the program? They move uh, the uh, wire weasel program to Georgia Air Force Base, but in the Air Force, and I was still too soon, I didn't have enough time in the 100. At the time there were rules, you had to be, if you got a certain assignment in airplay, you stayed with it until you got more. Before you go any further, could, could you just briefly explain what Wild Weasel, what that program is? Yeah, the Wild Weasel was uh, designed, I'm sorry, that when, when I went to Karat, what we did is we uh, wanted to suppress the SAMs. Uh, if they came up, we would need four strike pilots, four, uh, four uh, 105s with bombs and stuff, but we would find it. We had equipment that had a Doppler effect and said, okay, it's in that direction. It couldn't tell us the distance, and we had a light, a red light that would come on if uh, they, they fired. And so that was good because the red light come on, you knew the direction to look, and you're seeing a puff of smoke. And so my uh, Mach 1 F-100, I would have to dodge a Mach 3 SAM missile site, so that was a dance in a So you're basically flushing out people shooting at you. you know, literally dancing so that they would shoot at you. <laughs> so uh, you know, if they shot at you, then you knew where they were and you had four 105s with weapons, and then you went and you were attacked. In some cases, not me, uh, not that I know of. Uh, you would uh, run into 120 uh, radar control, four barrel, 37 millimeter, 57 millimeter, 80 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns. And so that's, they shot us down, and they, you know, really outnumbered us. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, you know, quite an experience. And if you shut them down, in some cases they shut the radar down. Then we didn't have any radar to find them in, you know, in the trees and what have you. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, but if they you know, shot it off, there'd still be residual smoke. And so you knew about where they were. And so my first mission, we went over to Hanoi, and I can remember, and all of a sudden, you know, you know oh, that was bad. But I can remember looking down right there in Hanoi, and uh, there was a 25-mile Johnson ring, which you're not supposed to strike within. But the uh, wing commander was in charge of Doppler, and then all of a sudden, Sam missile site comes up to the uh, south uh, west of Saigon. And oh geez, and, and Kep is to the north of Saigon, and not Saigon, it's Hanoi. And uh, well, you don't turn, you know, if you turn right for the SAM sites, they know where you're going. And you know, here you have, you know, four planes and the fifth one, which had a big radar cross section, duh, you know, that's a strawberry shortcake, get that sucker. And so uh, I smartly said, okay, you know, we went a little bit northwest instead of southwest. But Kep is, you know, right over there. I can look down and see Kep, you know, their big uh, base. I can look at no planes taking off. Okay, that's good. And okay, keep going. And then we got far enough. And then I drop down, you know, get out, you know, break the radar contact. And then, you know, I just the position, do tri visual tri uh, triangulation. And so down, down, come up, peak. Okay, you know, come down. And then I can remember, you know, to the two bird girls and two majors. And, Okay, fellas, you know, it's time to go up. And so, you know, it's someplace, you know, about 90 degrees to our left. We're going up to 10 and rolling in. Wish me luck. And I pull up to 10,000 feet and I dive in and it's a little hamlet. And uh, again, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. There's a cloud layer. It's early in the morning and uh, it's uh, just low land, uh, thin cl clouds. You could see some, you could see none. But I'm looking, I fly right over it, apparently, one of the women said, I think I saw it and stuff like that. But at the time, we already knew that uh, half the planes that made a second pass got shot down, and 100% of the planes that made a third pass, so it was forbidden to make a third pass. But with the thing, I said, hey, you know, we know where it is, you know, we'll wait. And then Alan Land, the guy I was talking about before, in the afternoon, he went and took it out, but 
it was a problem. It was 23 kilometers from downtown Hanoi. And uh, it took three days for the intelligence people to mark it outside uh, the 25 mile one. And the one that was still on the map, everybody knew that one didn't exist. That one never existed. <laughs> so, uh, so politics in and became a big Yeah, problem. yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, and, and the rules of engagement, uh, Mike, were absolutely stupid. This is what I was saying. I was very critical about. Uh, in, in the uh, Southeast Asia Command and Control of McNamara and his WITS kids that uh, the strike pilots that if somebody uh, fired uh, from a village on aircraft you couldn't strike back. If somebody fired within 100 yards of a major road you couldn't fire back. If it was uh, you know, 50 yards of a minor road and, this, and there was a whole sheet in some place I have that uh, of uh, engagement rules and regulations and you know, we would follow them. But they were stupid. You can't hit Hanoi, you can't hit uh, Haiphong, and you know, there's all the missiles down there, and you wait until they shoot them at you and, and, and you know, set up uh, anti-aircraft guns. And uh, some of my wild weasel guys who got shot down, they had their own uh, long stories to talk about. So anyway, so the, 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 what we would do, you, you asked about what the missile was, so what we would do is we would fly, and we first in, so we were air tapped. And if any SAMs come up, then you know we head over to them and, and do the uh, SAM suppression, you know, type of stuff. And you know, they would know your company. You're up there in in the sky, and you know they can see you. And uh, they're camouflaged in the ground, and they have you know just position guns of all sorts, and you don't know where they are until they all of a sudden they open up. And you know, were there many? Yeah, I was about 30 clicks of uh, west of Hanoi on my second or third mission. And uh, my Evo in the back seat, uh, Captain Paterka, said, Hey, Bob, roll over. Just take a quick look. Rice patties are beautiful. I've never seen anything so beautiful. All sparkling. And so I know, Mike, what this is. And so I've got my strike pilots. And so I roll over and look. And, hey, Paterka, you dumb shit. Take a look. That uh, under every one of those sparklers, the guy in black pajamas, they're shooting at us, you know, they, <laughs> and so they just shoot, you know, and, and the lucky billet, okay, you know, lucky flight, let's spread out, we're getting a lot of ground fire, so you just, you know, spread out and start weaving, and so it would be, you know, you know if, if you're, uh, and, 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 and let me, you'll cover another point of, you know, sort of where uh, the experience of, uh, officers, whether they are uh, Marines or Navy and Army or Air Force, that uh, when I was at the uh, Fighter Weapons Newsletter, uh, my uh, major was above me, uh, we were poo-pooing smart bombs. And uh, we, we had written several articles and so here's these uh, four young buck uh, engineers, about 20, 26 years old kids, come in, what the hell, you guys got clobbered in trying to hit the bridges in uh, Hanoi and, and that region in North Vietnam and this one you you sit in your cockpit at 14,000 feet and you, you guide a bomb down it's got a camera on it and you put the bomb and you know you know so you, you're not going to get hey you dummy and you know, we use rougher words and you know the, the anti-aircraft guns the most effective range is 14,000 uh, feet and so you want my head in watching uh, you know bombs go in and I'm you know plane is you know straight and level and I'm getting my ass shot off and uh, oh we didn't know that we, we can go up to you know 25,000 you go up to 20 above 18 then it's the random BB you know type of thing so a big difference in kill ratios you know well, when you get out of team, range. That's the teamwork when you have. Yeah that's where but that's where people who have the military experience tries to explain it to uh, you know, those engineers who were, uh, and even my, my own self in Burrow Research, we got an assignment that uh, there were night vision goggles and there were nine elements on them. And uh, if you were to bail out, you had to take them off because if you bail out with your uh, goggles on, night vision goggles, you snap your neck. The uh, CG was such. And so you can imagine, Mike, you know, here you are, you've got an emergency situation, your engine's going to blow up in two seconds, and oh, by the way, I've got to take get my glasses off, you know. No, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So my people design it, and they come up to me very proudly, the top in the you know, class in the world, and this kind of stuff. Hey, Bob, you know, we got this down, and, uh, you know, the spot is, you know, one tenth the size of the pixel. 
And so, uh, and I said, no, we're not going to go back to work and make the spot size half the size of the pixel. So you have all the resolution you want. But we went from 22 degrees to 45 degree, you know, full field of view, or 90 degree, 45 half field. Mm -hmm. And so now, instead of falling down a paper towel tube, you know, you, you got vision. And uh, so we have to do that. And, you know, Langley Air Force Base was very proud of us that, you know, okay, now we have, you know, things that are much shorter, much lighter than CG, and you bail off without them. They, you know, strip off when you go through the canopy or, you know, wind blowing off, whatever you want, but you don't break your neck, you know, it's less likely. And you got, you know, much, much wider field of view. So it's that, that experience on, in the field. And I remember when I was in South Vietnam that uh, one of my friends, I'm mean, going to Yale, we knew people who were ambassadors in Japan and they would be with the Russians. And the Russians were concerned at the time because Americans were doing live combat. And, you know, the only ones who had done live combat in, you know, let's say, pick a year, you know, what, 1967, uh, they were the pilots from World War II. And, you know, so that was 20 years earlier, and these guys were 40, you know, 50 years old. And so they were not flying planes anymore. And so the combat ready uh, Russians were not getting the comparable experience with, you know, flying under real life conditions when people are shooting at you is a whole lot different and you better learn fast. And, and the North Vietnamese, you know, did. I can remember we had a strike uh, missile and it had a seven mile range and the SAMs had an 18 mile range. So what, you know, you give me a rifle and I give you a pistol and we'll go out because we're up in the sky and you go at one end of a uh, football field and the rule is that you come with your pistol to shoot me and I have my rifle and as you come to me I get to shoot you. you know, them were the odds. <laughs> and so, uh, I don't like those odds. That's why right I said the command and control and, and the lack of equipment, you know, outdating technology. And even this last week uh, I, I reached my congresswoman uh, because I had a request for an F-35 pilot that we got state-of-the-art combat planes with 20-year-old munitions on it. And so when he said he, he wanted a laser gun on his F-35, and uh, the congresswoman, she said, yeah, I love my 30-millimeter uh, uh, cannon. I understand that request. So, so that, it's that kind of stuff we have experience and it needs to be pressured on because, oh, well, it's going to cost money. Yeah, well, if you don't do money, you're going to send Bob Bro, you know, against uh, missile sites that go Mach 3 against my Mach 1 plane, and I have to figure it out. That's not right. Is, is that what kind of tickled your interest in technology? Was it trying to marry your experience in the military with the, the knowledge that technology is really going to be the thing that brings it together or takes it up the next step? That happened, my, but my motivation was uh, the universe. And you know, you're doing these for the Friday pilots, and I've taken the Friday pilots up to uh, the LBT on Mount Graham and Kick Peak and stuff like that, and they want to be Han Solos. That they flew and they you know, love that, but now I can take them to fly the universe, not this galaxy alone. We can go to other galaxies. And we have lots and lots of long uh, trips and talks. So it takes three hours to get to Mount Graham, three hours back. And so it's a captured audience. And then my astronomy friends just, uh, you know, just wow. And they talk with astronomers who are doing uh, all sorts of physics from different countries. And uh, no, my, my role as a 13 year old was to explore our universe and to understand it more. I myself have had launch no launch decision on six uh, uh, famous uh, telescopes and if I said no it would be a 400 million dollar no because there'd be a standing army waiting they had to keep them and in some cases I remember ISO or ESA system and it was all packaged ready to be shipped to uh, French uh, Guiana for launch and uh, I had a week to make the decision whether to ship it or they had to take it apart, tear it apart and uh, redo a certain piece of it. 
So it's, it's pretty awesome. And it, but it's it, the thing that's beautiful about astronomy and, and uh, fighter pilots is they're so akin in God's sake. They're, you know, they're underpaid, they're passionate about uh, you know, what there is astronomy or, or, or fighter pilot, uh, and it's, it's you know, really uh, high risk, but they're dedicated for all, all their life. And, uh, and, and, you know, the new information and you parallel process, and, you know, this is going to upset everybody, but as, as a fighter pilot, uh, you have some nine degrees of freedom. I'm a physicist, yeah, and everybody, you know, Mike's waving and said, no, 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 you know, yes, there's X, Y, Z in time, okay, you know, you know, you, you know that. Yeah, but as a fighter pilot, you've got this thing called a throttle. Oh, yeah, okay, that's another degree of freedom. Oh, by the way, I have an afterburner. Oh, that's another degree of freedom. Okay. And, oh, I can be at 400 feet at, off the ground, or I can be at 40,000 feet where I can exchange my altitude for speed. And so there's another couple of degrees of freedom. And you have to process these things one time south of Hanoi, all of a sudden, you know, my uh, Evo, Jim Paterke, he called out to the flight, and we're picking up possible MIG at 6 o'clock, MIG radar. <laughs> you know, heads were twisting like crazy and zigging and zagging, and uh, it turned out to be, uh, we debunked it, and it was a ground-based portable radar system. But what it was, was that you have uh, just fractions of a second to react, and you have to process all this information. And so in business and in uh, astronomy, you, you have a lot, a lot of pieces, many, many dimensions. And uh, so you're, you're constantly, okay, uh, and, but as a fighter pilot, you have to do it, you know, sometimes, you know, within seconds, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately, but the discipline of considering all these different options is amenable. So they're, they're so close together. Mm -hmm. you know, I've enjoyed taking them uh, with Don you know, for F-16 simulator rides, and they just, you know, these astronomers love the fighter pilots and, and the experience. And one of them shot up. Uh, the large binocular telescope, you know, simulation, and uh, so, you know, he, he still talks about it, and uh, so it's a win-win situation for us all. So what do you like about that, ex exploring the universe? What's, what does that mean to you? Oh, uh, it's, I live in a world uh, beyond your dreams and your fantasies of uh, the, uh, the Martian, uh, the movie, and, uh, but you know, I lived all these things. I've gone, uh, I helped design Cassini, which is going around Saturn, and uh, Galileo that went uh, to Jupiter. And so, and my personal friends who are on New Horizon, the Pluto probe. And so it's not uh, a, a somebody else experience, it's my experience. And these you know, people would send me data you know, before it gets into public domain, uh, that, you know, hey, Bob, you want to know this, you want to know that. Mm -hmm. And so understanding uh, why uh, we have uh, a universe and the possibility of life in uh, other parts of the uh, universe and the mathematics of it and the physics of it, it's always to this day, uh, you know, stretching. I just had my 76th birthday. I'm still a young buck at heart. That lieutenant is still as young as enthusiastic. And you can see it. I know it's just, uh, it's, it's uh, the physics and of, of astronomy and astrophysics and bioastrophysics. Uh, and what we're finding even about our own planet is, uh, is thrilling. I'm honored, you know, to have played in this game. So that decision of being either an astronaut or a founder of Burrow Research, I'm glad I founded Burrow Research. Very cool. Is there anyone that, or anything or an incident or anything that you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I don't, you know, since we're into astronomy, I can remember now I'm a fourth year graduate student in my analysis. Well, Dr. Shack has gotten me a contract from NASA to do analyze what's called a, a large uh, space uh, uh, telescope. Uh, 
which then became known as a space telescope because it was instead of three meters, 2.4, so I wanted to save the large space for something else. But that became the Hubble. And uh, so uh, I get this assignment and I have to do BRDF measurement. I created the concept of stray light analysis. The terminology is mine from 40 years ago. And, uh, Stray light analysis. Yeah, the, you know, you do it all the time. You know, and you know, you you drive in and and you put your hand up to the block the sun, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and your windshield is you know dirty in the sunset, and you put the wash. Uh, I could pay five thousand dollars a day to answer those questions, <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know, from that end of it, but you know, in, in the military discipline, uh, you know, so I combine the both of them. Now, I'm a graduate student, I do this analysis in the Hubble telescope and everybody's anxious, you know, okay, uh, you know, this is so uh, good, I have to, you know, okay, and, and when I'm doing it, they uh, send me down to uh, Princeton, you know, I remember I went to Yale and so to Dr. Spitzer, and there's a Spitzer telescope up there in the Nobel Laureate, that's one of five that I worked one on, one on alone on. So, I go in his office and it's very magnificent, all oh, these oh, marble blocks up in his office and it's uh, maybe a 12, 14 foot ceiling and thin windows and very, very spacious and file cabinets, all those kind of things. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Bro? Oh, um, not a doctor yet. And uh, he says, so oh, NASA wants me you know, to talk with you about oh, what you're doing. How long have you been working on the Hubble telescope? Oh, about a year and a half. Oh, do you really think all that's necessary? And so, you know, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so we go in and we talk. He was the father of uh, opening astronomical observatory, and it was still in space. And so, well, how did you do the stray light analysis? Oh, we just went to a warehouse down in Cape Canaveral and got a floodlight and this kind of stuff. And well, I won't go into the technicality, but in you know the next half hour, I was asking him questions. And oh, no, I says, yes, sir, you should be able to see it. From the detector, you see the second area. Oh, yeah, I never knew that. I never thought of that. And you see about this. And he had actually, in that era, he had wires which are in the field of view. And you know, I said, Yeah, yeah, they were a lot of scattered. We just put a black blanket over them. And so, uh, so I said, Well, did you get these kind of measurements? We call them point stress transmission. And I go up to the chalkboard and I write this chart. Well, this is going to be real high because we're going to get you know, straight light from this thing and then it'll drop down, but you're still the next thing is this thing. And, uh, over and gets on the phone. I said, Tom, come in here. Your little graduate assistant comes in. Hey, uh, Bob, you tell him what you want. And so I explained to him, you know, what the point's in. So, okay, student goes, and you know, we've been in there for now two hours or so. And uh, student comes back. Dr. Spitzer goes to the door, and I'm a good 20 feet away still at the chalkboard. And uh, he uh, you know, gets his, you know, document from the student and he's looking at it and looking at the board and it's 20 feet away. He says, by God, I think you got it. And, and so I don't know what he's talking about. He says, come here, come here, come here, come here. And the, uh, my, the, uh, what I had drawn on the board was an exact replica of uh, what he held in his hands. In his hands he had the absolute ordinance, uh, you know, you know, magnitude of it, but he's looking at it. It's a perfect match, wow. and uh, so I'm going to tell NASA, you know, keep funding you. You're doing good things. So then, about six months later, I give my final presentation on the design of uh, the uh, large space, t you know, the space telescope as it was in time. And so I stand in front of these power people, uh, uh, Bob Hill, who is the science advisor to NASA and the Hubble and uh, all these, you know, the power people, they, you know, the much, much outweigh me, you know, I got 20, 30 years in, uh, you know, experience on science and physics and astronomy and uh, so uh, I stand boldly in front of them at the end, it's like two hours to talk about everything I did and I tell them that uh, the Hubble telescope is presently configured with 144 angle vanes on it with state of the art Martin Blake black coating on it. It's only 10 or 20 percent better than if you took out all the vein structure, threw it away, and went down to Ace Hardware and bought a spray can of black paint. 
I waited for 25 seconds and nobody laughed. They was looking at me like, you know, smart ass, you know, graduate student, you're dead. And then the next started turning red at me in 20, 25 seconds, so I knew, okay, it's time. I said, here's why. And then I explained that the way the design was is nothing like the Hubble telescope is today. It was sun kept the angle, it was a cutaway tube, and it kept the sun out from coming in. But the earth light would come up and hit this tube, and 80% of the energy would go straight to the primary mirror and then scatter to the detector. And so now the military training kicks in that, you know, you know, we've all had generals who, or you know, they're good guys and stuff like that. And you can pull the rug, rug out from under the general or surprise him in some way, but you better be there to catch him, right? Yeah, you can have fun with him, but you're not going to make a fool of him. And so I knew that, and so I had analyzed six different systems, and I had talked about it. And I said, if you use my design of the system, it'll improve your, your uh, Hubble telescope performance by a factor of 100,000 over your specification. Whoa, 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 whoa. Say that again? Why? And so I explained, and you know, illumination from the Earth would go and hit a vein and 99% absorption in this material, 10% transfer, another 99% absorption. That's a factor of 100,000. It was more complicated than that. Oh, wow. And so, uh, now I got a, a smile on my face because afterwards, uh, all you people who are watching this, you know, you don't even remember my name right now, but you'll remember the interview for this reason. That uh, with uh, three super scientists on NASA, and, oh Bob, you know, we've never expected this much. That two and a half percent of our budget has to go to universities or small businesses, and we don't expect them. But Bob, you, you did absolutely marvelous. We we, we love it. We'll change the design. And uh, so uh, my nickname, for all of you people who know what the Hubble telescope looks like with that shield on it, my nickname for it, oh, I'm going to be in trouble, is a toilet seat design. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, 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 don't use it, don't use that. But here I'm in a public archive, you know what I'm saying? And I, had, I had six different systems, and you know, that was you know, by, by far the best. So again, it's a chutzpah of, uh, the fighter pilot of if you know you, you tell it the way it is and here I'm going against all these scientists that had designed the first one the way the Hubble telescope is designed today has almost no correlation with what I was given in 1972 you know and what I changed it to 1974 so I'm claiming that the baffles all the mechanical structure uh, for this tray light spray that's mine all right but that comes from the Air Force so does the awesomeness of the universe and the space and the, you know you see Hubble and you see the photography and you see all of that and it's just it's it's just awesome. Yeah, hey, uh, my back is shaking. It, 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 yeah, it is. A, a universe is so magnificent. But then you but you're in the details of trying to make of not trying but making that work. You know of increasing you know by a hundred thousand fold. Yeah. So. Do you find more pleasure in the detail of trying to get to where you're able to take those photographs that are so... Uh, keep going, keep going. You know, take the photographs, but take them so you can distinguish that there's a livable planet and another you know, piece of the galaxy okay. and it's habitable and it has an atmosphere it has water and carbon, di uh, carbon uh, dioxide and you know, maybe we have another life form there, and surely we do. So when you're looking at planets that are um, orbiting around a, a distant sun, and that backlighting is what washes it out and makes it difficult to see, is that kind of what you're working on? That Yes, you know, the things that the telescopes that we supply, like the Hubble, and uh, X-ray multiple mirror telescope, we do it in different wavelengths, and uh, you know, or just uh, Chandra and all these different, uh, you know, famous uh, systems. Yeah, and looking at, uh, and you know, in some cases now, other people I've trained, hundreds of them, are doing uh, the, my proteges. I claim them, but uh, they're doing science far beyond mine because at the time we did not have the technology, the CCDs that we have today, and so they just carried it off, and uh, but they carried it off to, okay, we can find planets, and now, you know, many thousands of them. Oh, by the way, we can now, you know, test atmospheres, 
and uh, oh, by the way, was you know they were studying uh, the uh, what what made life happen on Earth, and uh, you know when did it happen, and even uh, you you know everybody knows there's water, right? And you know you know there's different kinds of water. Oh yeah, deuterium. There's you know heavy water and all that kind of. Thing. No, Mike. There's 14 different types or more. You know you know, people watching them. Isotopes. And so the kind of isotopes, you know, uh, that they have of water determines on how this planet got water. Because at one time, you know, when we got hit, you know, four and a half billion years ago, that it, you know, there wasn't any water. Everything was boiling. And uh, if it was, it was in steam, you know, trapped in the ground. But that's not enough. And so where did it come from? And so, you know, why do we exist? And... Uh, so this is stuff that they dig out of, you know, in going and picking up rocks. Uh, Jim McDivitt, who was you know, the Apollo 9 uh, commander and stuff like that, yeah. And talking to him every Friday, you know, elbow to elbow, uh, yeah, you know, getting yeah, yeah, those, uh, fun. no, it's, uh, it's a thrill of, of uh, you know, beyond, I've been rewarded beyond expectations. Well, I think it's probably safe to say that the dreams of that 13-year-old uh, were fulfilled. I am very proud that uh, when the choices I follow that dream. I was born to do something. I really believe that. And as a 13-year-old, I had the moment to meditate. But that meditation on Saturday was, this is where I'm going to go, and here's how I'm going to do it, and these are the steps. And, uh, and then uh, following it and having the courage to, when I fail so many times, to pick myself up and keep on walking. The clarity. It's so much easier when you have a plan, that when you, you know you were born to do that, and it's, and it's working, and it's fun. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing your story with me. and. Uh... It's been a pleasure meeting you and talking to you. We could go on for days, but uh, <laughs> thank you, Bob.